Let me say that maybe I'll sit down there a few more times. Wow, every time I get up, there's a few more people. That's wonderful. We're looking forward to being here with the brethren at East End. I want to explain something before I say something further about that. If you are one of those people who has an outline, and it has blanks in it, there's just a line in certain places, you're going to have to listen, and I'm going to try to stay with the outline, and I'll give you the word that can go in that outline, and you'll be able to fill it in. Don't worry about the spelling, just try to see if you get that word. Because I made the outline, and then I went through and I took away certain words and just put a line in. And did that so you can fill it in. So if you've got an outline with a blank line in it, that's what it's for. And... Uh, up here, the, whoever was called on for the final prayer, they're going to lead the final prayer. Is that right? No, no, no. I, I, so. You've got to sort it out. Okay, it's good stuff. Thank you for inviting me. Um, as you say that earlier this week, I gave Jer a little bit of a scare. I talked with him, and I said, I might not be able to make it for the meeting. I said, I've had a couple of rough days at home. I've been sick. Maybe you'll have to take the meeting. He thought at first I was joking with him because in our family we joke a lot with one another. But it wasn't a joke. He soon found out that wasn't a joke at all. And uh, the Lord blessed us. We were able to come this way and work thus far in the meeting. Uh, Patsy and I have appreciated the warmth of welcome that we've had from so many. It's good to be with you. The most important thing that we've had is the opportunity to open God's Word and speak about that. And anybody that knows me will know that there's nothing I would rather do than sit and talk about God's Word. So thank you for being here. I never dreamed that I would go to East End in Toronto and connect with somebody from India and who knows, we may have crossed pathways over there at one time. And certainly we know people that you know, and, and that's the case. We welcome each and every one. It's a wonderful gathering of people. And isn't it great that we can all join together and remember the Lord and sing praises to God and build up and strengthen one another. And it doesn't matter where we came from on the face of the earth. All that matters is where we are right now, and that is in Christ Jesus. And if you're not in him, then we want to encourage you to think very carefully about that need in your life and encourage you to follow that. I want to talk in this period of time regarding the matter of don't quit. It's the simplest title of any of the titles I chose for the weekend. And you might wonder, well, what's that all about? It's just as simple as it is, don't quit. I run into people every once in a while, and they say, well, I'm finished with the church, I'm finished with this, I'm, and I, well, wait, wait, wait a minute, what do you mean you're finished with it? Oh, I don't need it anymore, it served a purpose for me, but I don't need it. Really? You don't need a part of God's eternal plan, a part of that which God had established, in which he would take and it displays for us the manifold wisdom of God. We'll get to the outline in just a minute. But the manifold wisdom of God means that God could take people, much as we are today, from all different nations of the world, all different language groups, all different skin colors, and we could all be together and be one in Christ Jesus. And the world needs that today. We live in a divided world in many places. But we can find and rally around the picture that's painted within this book and be what God wants us to be, to be the very best husbands or wives or sons or daughters or parents 
We could be the very best employee that anyone would have or employer if we happen to be the one in charge. We can have the best life now and we can have a home in heaven one day. But you can't get it if you don't hold on to it to the end. There's a passage that I quoted in the front of the outline and it is from the Apostle Paul's pen and it's Romans 13 and verses 11 through 14. I'm going to read it as it appears in the outline. He said, and do this, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand, therefore let us cast off the works of darkness, let us put on the armor of light, let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. I chose that passage because it says this and it reminds us, no matter where we are in life, whether we're further along or whether we're still young, every day that the clock turns and every day the sun sets and rises again by God's goodness we are near to our salvation because we're working on a diminishing timeline we're getting closer and closer now some of we older ones may be more aware of that day after day but don't let it fool you I have seen with my own eyes the very young gone in a moment. I've seen those at other places in life gone. So no matter where we are, we are near our salvation. That means I have less time than I had when I obeyed the gospel. Whatever it may be, and I'm not trying to guess at how long I'm going to be here, it's the Lord's call, not mine. My life is in His hands, even as yours is. If He grants me another day, I'll have another day, and I'll use it to his glory. Now, you can look at that text. There's a lot in it, and I'm going to skip over that. I want to start with the story, and I want to share that with you, and hopefully it's not going to be one of those tearjerker ones, because we've had a few of those. Years ago, when I was young, oh yes, I was young once, long time ago now, and I met with someone who was quite a bit older than I was. In fact, I was probably in my early 20s. And they were at that time in their upper 60s, which I thought was relatively old. I don't think so much so now. And uh, she looked at me and she said, I wish I was young like you. I looked at her and I said, whoa, wait a minute, why would you want to be young like me? In fact, I said, as I was looking at you, I was thinking, I'd like to be where you are in life. And she got this puzzled look on her face and she said, why? Why would anybody young want to be old like me? I explained to her this. I said, I've watched your life. You've already climbed over lots of mountains. God's helped you over them or helped you around them or helped you through them. You've already gone across a lot of rivers. You walked on a lot of lonely pathways. You know what it's like to lose a loved one. You know what it's like to sacrifice. You know what it's like to do without things. And here you are and you can almost see the finish line. Because as we get older, we get more and more aware that there's a finish line out there for life. And there's a day when we're going to say goodbye earth and hello God. And I said, you're almost there. I said, here I am. I'm a young man. I said, I've made a commitment to Jesus that I'm going to serve him all my days. But something could go wrong. Some tragedy could unfold in my life, some circumstance, some situation might rise and, and I might find myself 
where I shouldn't be. And I could lose it all. I said, I'd rather be where you are, where I can look out there and see the finish line in front of me and know I've almost made it. She looked back at me and she smiled and she said, I never thought about that before. Well, I said, you keep on thinking about and get your eyes on that finish line. I want to suggest to you, whether you're young or old, wherever you are today, put your eyes on that finish line. That finish line is the Heavenly Father waiting for you to finish your journey here so that you can go on to what has been prepared for you. And one day that will be yours. That's important for us to see. I've said that because you don't want to quit. You don't want to almost make it. You want to make it all together. Not almost, but all together. That's what we want. And to do that, that means we've got to hold on to what we started and never let go. I'd like you to turn to Hebrews 10 with me. If my throat gets a little dry, I'm going to take a little bit of water here. Turn to Hebrews 10. We've made reference to Hebrews quite a few times in this meeting. It's one of my favorite books because it has so much within it. Well, what we want to do just here is we want to turn to Hebrews 10. And uh, we want to understand that the writer is making a contrast between the Old Testament sacrifices in which they offered animals and the blood of bulls and goats and what Christ offered when he died on the cross. And in this chapter, he points out that there are good things that have come through Christ that make the others only seem like shadows, only just... And I've said to people, if you're walking down the street on a sunny day, and you'd agree that you're going to meet somebody at a certain corner, I'm not going to name corners, I've been on enough streets in Toronto this weekend, I'd forget them if I told you. But anyway, you're going to meet at this particular corner. And you get there, and you can see their shadow come, and you know they're approaching. And they just stop over there and all you can see is their shadow and they begin to faintly talk to you. Wouldn't you like to close the gap and be there face to face and talk with them? What God had under the old covenant was a shadow of what was going to be. That all of that blood of bulls and goats was but a shadow of the greater sacrifice that was going to set us free the one we remembered around the Lord's table this morning, the blood and sacrifice of Jesus. Look in verse number 5. We read this earlier. We're going to read it again. Therefore, when he came into the world, he, Jesus, said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. You see, all of those Old Testament families were toward the end that there would be a family tree that would describe the flesh side of Jesus to us. That he was the seed of David, that he was the son of Abraham. All of that was essential. God did that. There's a purpose for that. And here he was. He came. He said, a body you prepared for me. He was brought into this world in a special special way. Burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin you had no pleasure. Then I said, behold... I am come in the volume of the book it's written of me to do your will, O God. We mentioned this the other night. Over 325 clear messianic promises, promises of the Christ, beginning as early as Genesis 3.15. You come along and you have the promises that through Abraham and his seed all nations would be blessed. That's found in Genesis 12, 18, 22, 26, 28. And then we get to Genesis 49, verse 10, and we're told that the seed is going to come through the tribe of Judah. It's going to be through Judah that the ruler would come. And on and on we go. God revealing his plan from eternity and what his son would do. And when his son came, 
He didn't just take and connect with one of these promises or maybe two of them. Every single one of the promises was fulfilled in him. Every single one that needed thee, God knew what he was doing. Now watch with me. Says those things written in the volume of the book. He says, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. This is verse 9. He takes away the first, the first covenant, that he may establish the second. By that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Doesn't need to be repeated. Doesn't need to be done again. Once for all time, the ultimate sacrifice. How wonderful is that? Now, if you know it, and I know it, and it's through that that we find cleansing, then what we need to do is appreciate what has been accomplished. I'm going to continue to read at verse 11. This is new material. Every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. That's under the old system. But this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. It's important for us to understand as Christians, not only did he die on the cross in order to save us from sin, but he was buried in a tomb and he was raised from the dead and ascended on high to sit at the Father's right hand at the place of power and authority. Remember in Matthew 28, Jesus said, All power and authority has been given on me in heaven and earth. Go and teach all nations, you see. You can read the rest of it there. He had all power and authority. He went, sat at the right hand of God. But we read further here. It says here, From that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. In other words, every enemy that's conquered. Now we could go into all kinds of details there, but let me just suggest this. The greatest enemy that's to be conquered is death. And you know how you conquer death? By a resurrection. God raised his son from the dead. And you and I are told by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 that just as he was raised from the dead, we'll be raised from the dead. The last enemy is death. And that will be conquered one day. And we will rise from the graves and go home to be with him. Think of that. He goes on to say, For by one offering, verse number 14, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Sanctified means we're set apart to God's service. We're set apart to serve and honor Him. It's so because Christ died for us. For the Holy Spirit also witnessed to us. For after He has said before, This is the covenant I will make with them after those days, said the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts. And in their minds will I write them. You don't have to carry around. Now, I notice, and it's everywhere in Ontario, people walk around. They can't walk down the street if they're not looking at their cell phone. I, how did we ever get along before we had cell phones? How did we know what to do without a cell phone? I'm in a grocery store, and a lady's got a cell phone in her hand. Mom, should I get this or should I get that? She's 47 years old and she's calling mom to find out what she should get. Cell phones. But what about that? God has given us his son. We can follow him. And in this new situation, God said, I'm not going to send him a message. I like Jeremy's message over here. You may have seen it for a moment. God's, not, God's going to call you, but he's not going to call you on your cell phone. So shut it off because we're here, right? We're not going to be depending on the call from cell phone. But God was going to write his new covenant on our hearts and on our mind. You have to be taught it. You have to take and imbibe it. You have to study in order to have it. 
And that's how you have it within you. And when we have it within us, we're going to live it. And when we live it, we're going to glorify God. And when we do that, God is going to be in our midst, even as He is today as we meet together. So God said, I'm going to write it in their hearts, in their mind. That's why if you find somebody dedicated to Christ, you can ask them why they believe, and they'll probably be able to tell you. They might not tell you as long as Jeremy might tell you, or I might tell you, but they'll tell you, they'll know. Because you didn't get there by mistake or accident. You know what you did to obey the gospel. And you'll be able to tell people. But watch further here. Here's the most wonderful thing. In verse 17 of the new covenant. Then he adds. Their sins and lawless deeds. I will remember no more. Think of that. God said, I'm going to take them away and I'm not going to remember them anymore. They're gone. I've met people in my life and they said, well, I'm just am a little bit annoyed right now. And I, what are you annoyed at? Well, so-and-so did such and such to me. And, and they pointed to some other person, you know. They've offended me or they've caused me problems. And then they'll turn around and they'll say, you know, they did that before, but I forgave them, but it was back in June of the 14th of, of 2014 when they did that at 9 o'clock in the morning, and yes, I've forgotten it. No, you didn't forget it. But when God says, I'm going to take it away and remember it no more, it's never going to meet you again. If you say out of that sin, it's not going to come and greet you again. It's not going to stand in your way of anything that God has because God said, this is what I'm going to do for you. Wow, what a God. I was the one that nailed Jesus to the cross, and I know every one of you sang it as if you were the one. We did it, didn't we? We put him there. But God's still willing to forgive us. Their sins and lawless deeds I will remember more, no more. Now watch verse 18. Now where there is remission of these, there's no longer an offering for sin, no longer a need for that. That's why people like Jeremy and other gentlemen that preach the gospel keep on preaching, Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And on and on we go. We're going to keep preaching that. The world doesn't like it. But God said it. And you know our very hope depends on that. Because God loved me, and he sent his son, allowed him to live a perfect life, die on the cross, shed his blood, buried in a tomb, raised from the dead, and ascended on high after receipt of witnesses. My hope rests on that. Doesn't have to happen again. Happened one time in time. I should be able to remember some details about that by reading the scripture, shouldn't I? Well, let's go just a little bit further here. I want you to come with me down to verse 35 in chapter 10. Now, you read everything in between. I'm only doing this because of time factor, okay? I don't skip over verses because I don't like what the verses say. I wish I had time, but... Jeremy said I could preach that I was finished, so I don't have another appointment till tomorrow morning, but I know you probably do, so we better shorten it before then. But pick up with me at this place. This is important, if nothing else. The writer said, Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. That's where I get don't quit from. Don't give up. Don't quit. 
You just keep on keeping on. Day after day, keep on. He said, for yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. That's Christ. Now the just shall live by faith. If anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. You turn aside, you turn your back to God, that's bringing problems on yourself. He said, we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but those who believe to the saving of the soul. I can almost see the finish line. What about you? Not going to quit. Some days may seem harder walk uphill. Some may seem steeper going this way. Some may face a wall that I'm wondering how am I going to get through. But God is greater than any wall, greater than any mountain, greater than any obstacle, greater than any problem that I might have. And I'm with God. And God's with me. We can do it. We can go all the way through to the finish line. That's what the Hebrew writers tried to encourage. Now, there's other things that we could say from that passage. But I want to go over here a little bit further. I want you to go to Hebrews 12 with me for just a moment. And I know I'm not going to cover all, but that's why I give out outlines. Because most of the time I don't cover everything in the outline. But I can hope to. And you can take it home and you can look at it at your leisure. Hebrews 12. Now everybody here knows about Hebrews 11. I know. We call it the honor roll of Old Testament worthies. Men and women who lived under the Old Testament and served God. Some of them died in faith. Some of them lived in faith. Some of them suffered in faith. Some of them saw loved ones perish in faith. And yet they never gave up. Now look at chapter 12 because here he comes. Therefore we also, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, it's just like their lives are there, just like a cloud of witnesses, and now we're on the running course. Now it's our turn. What are we going to do? He says, let us lay aside every weight. When they were training for running races, they would fasten weights to their arms and to their legs. Then the day of the race, they'd lay them aside so they could run with all the vigor, all the renewed muscle strength they had. He says to us, lay aside every weight. What are some of those things we carry around? Sometimes we're burdened down and we've got this great big old sack of yesterday's problems. Why? Why can't we just take and lay at the feet of God and leave it there? And just take on what today gives. Didn't Jesus say in the Sermon on the Mount, sufficient unto the day are the evils thereof? In other words, don't borrow from tomorrow. If the Lord grants us tomorrow, he'll give us health and strength and ability to deal with the things of tomorrow. But here we go now. Lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Every one of us has got areas in our life where we are more vulnerable, more ready to trip and fall into sin. And they're different for you than they are for me, probably. And yours, different than the person next to you. But if we're aware of that, then what we do is stay away from those things, not get ourselves in a place where we're exposed to them. Stay away from them all together. He says, move away from those things. Let us run with endurance the race that's set before us. You know what endurance is? That's not saying, well, I'm just going to sit down here. You go ahead. I'll maybe catch up with you later. We're going to just keep on going. If the way's hard, we're going to go. I don't know if you watch Patsy and I during the course of the time here. Every once in a while, I get a little bit wobbly and she grab hold of my hand. People say, oh, isn't that nice? Yeah, it is nice. It's a whole lot easier to keep me standing up than pick me up from the ground. But you see, that's there. I know there's a whole lot more to just her holding my hand. But 
nonetheless, run with endurance. You know why God said, I want you to meet on the Lord's Day? I want you to come to, I didn't say Lord's Day, but the idea of coming together in assembly. We need one another. Do you know that this is your oasis in the desert? I've been over to places where they had a desert. I'd never seen so much sand in all my life. And it was only 105 the day we were out in the desert in, in uh, United Arab Emirates. And I said, I think I like Niagara a whole lot better than the desert. But I'm told that the camels would trudge across the desert and the sand might be blinding them and they just keep going because out ahead was palm trees and there's water that's fresh that they could drink. And if they just kept plodding along, they could get there. This gathering on the Lord's Day is our place of rest our place of comfort, our place of peace, our place of joy, our place in which we can glorify God and we can gain strength so that when we go out of these doors and back out into that world out there, we can see more opportunities to reach people with the gospel for one thing and we can let the influence of the world stay away from our lives so that we can glorify God. I need to be with you on Sunday. Well, I have with the people I meet with and worship with, even the Jer needs to be with you and you need to be with him and one another. Is God wonderful? He wants us to be together because we'll find strength. So he said, let us run with endurance the race that's set before us, looking unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith. Now, think about that. We look at it. We come up with different explanations for author and finisher. But let's just do it this way. Here is the author, the one that begins. Here is the finisher, the one that finishes. Jesus did everything he needed to do in order that you and I might be saved. Are we going to do everything that we can do to finish the journey that we started on in following him? That's encouragement. It says here, who for the joy that was set before him. I have a sermon I put together on that subject, the joy. What kind of joy did Jesus have? Did he go to the cross? That, that doesn't sound like something I'd be joyfully excited about. When he went to the cross, he knew he was going to do his father's will. When he went to the cross, he knew the price would be paid for sins that people could be saved. When he went to the cross and conquered death through the resurrection, he knew that hope could be offered to the sons of men, that they could have hope that would reach beyond this life. And I can't help but think that there wasn't some joy in his heart that he could finally go back home to heaven. Because, you know, we talk about going to heaven one day, have you ever thought about what he did when he left the glories of heaven and came to this earth in order to save us? Just think of the joy that would have been to return to his rightful place in heaven. But he did what needed to be done. I want to go to that place one day, and I know you do as well. Now, I'm just going to stop at that place. There's much more in the outline. Please read it. Please look at it. But here's the advice I'm going to close with. Don't quit. Whatever happened, do not give up. You can check out what's being taught by this word right here. You can follow in the footsteps of Jesus. And you can go home and be with him forevermore. We hold that out for you. We want you to think about that. If you're here... You believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Repent of your sins. Confess your faith in him as the Son of God. And be buried with him in the waters of baptism for the remission of sins. Rise to walk in newness of life. If you've done that and you faltered or tripped or fallen along the way, then may we encourage you as they did in Acts 8 
to a man who was a Christian and who sinned. Repent and pray God for forgiveness. And he said, would you pray for me? And they said, yes, they would. And we will too. I'm not ashamed to hold my Lord, nor to defend his cause. Maintain the honors of his word.